Good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for your attention uh, to come to this webinar. Um, so I'm going to discuss today um, the use of Horizon Discovery's um, assays, particularly around arsenic cell lines and bespoke assay conditions, um, to uh, assist our clients in their mission for drug discovery, target identification, and validation. So I'd like to go through a recap on Horizon's mission, which um, was set up by the company founders uh, Chris Torrance and Abata Badili, which is to decode the human genome and accelerate the discovery of personalized medicines. So what we want to do is uh, to tailor the right drugs, bring them to the right patients at the right time. Uh, we're a company that's been going about five years, there's about 75 of us, and we're based at the Cambridge Research Park to the north of Cambridge in the UK. So as you will know, genetic variations exist in patient populations, and especially in the uh, in the arena of oncology, um, the, the course of disease and the sensitivity to drugs is defined by genetic differences between tumors and also within the patients as well. So there's been a great advance in sequencing technologies and um, what Horizon wants to position itself in is as a, a high-end CRO which um, provides sort of model systems so that you can have patients in a test tube which we think will lead to um, improved drug discovery, bringing drugs to, to market and to patient benefit cheaper and faster than before. So what we primarily use um, is our precision uh, gene editing model, which we call Genesis. So this exploits uh, the technology developed by Capecci in um, mouse embryonic cells for knockout mice, which, uh, as you may know, is not, not very effective in terms of the plasma-based delivery methods in uh, mammalian somatic cells. But by using uh, a virus, and more on this in a minute, we're able to increase the efficiency of this gene editing and make um, gene editing by homologous recombination a facile and predictable technique. So this is a virus which is non-pathogenic. Most of us have been infected with it, and, um, and so it's quite safe to use. It is a single-stranded DNA virus which can deliver reasonable size uh, selection cassettes into cells. Um, so it isn't quite clear why it's so effective. Um, we have formed alliances and two of the uh, most eminent biologists in AAV um, are on our scientific advisory board and uh, they're working to understand the mechanism better and to optimize this technique. But what it can do is optimize the efficiency of homologous recombination over non-homologous end joining by approximately a thousand fold. So this enables the rapid and precise alteration of any sequence in the genome of human cells. We're able to change this one nucleotide out of the three billion. Horizon has got the dominant IP position on this technology. We've got worldwide protection which runs out for a number of years. And this technology is underpinned by um, dozens of millions of dollars of NIH funding and it's been used in several hundred peer review publications by our collaborators and uh, a bunch of relationships currently based on alumni of, the, of uh, Vogelstein's labs in Baltimore. So if we compare our platform to other uh, mechanisms of gene editing, we have advantages and disadvantages, but the key thing we have is precision because we're the only uh, platform which uses homologous recombination. All the others, be they zinc fingers, metanuclease, or talons, use non-homologous end joining and therefore uh, the mechanism involves forming it a DNA break which could be repaired in a way that's unexpected. So our technology is highly competitive in time with the, the other ones for introducing single allele knock-ins, but we do have a disadvantage in knocking out two or three alleles at a time. We would have to use our technology sequentially, whereas some of the nucleases can take out both copies at once. But just to emphasize, it's the highest precision method and the most flexible. So we're able to use this technology to do gene editing in a number of ways, both simple and highly ambitious. So we're able, in, in the knock-in uh, invocation of this, to engineer, as I just said, a single nucleotide within a cancer genome. For example, we can introduce or eliminate RAS mutations. Uh, we can also use conventional technique, um, uh, use extensively the production of knockout mice to do insertional gene disruption, perhaps targeting axon 1 with a drug-selectable marker. Uh, by using the Crelox system, we can eliminate the markers we introduced and create gene deletions, just leaving a 14-nucleotide sort of fossil of our engineering. 
Um, and then with patients and with good design, we're able to do very ambitious gene editing. For example, with a two-step targeting method, we're able to use long-range deletions, take out whole chromosome arms, if that will lead to a viable cell. And we can also recreate the translocation seen in leukemia, again using the FLOX technology. And one thing we're investigating at the moment is the use of um, DNA sequences like the SP40 origin replication to mimic amplifications as are seen in many cancers. So this technology has been employed in over 70 different types of parental cells when we've um, completed 500 projects. And this is in multiple sort of tissue types. So it's a, it's a very flexible technology. So the core product uh, which Horizon uh, has, is built around is what we call the X-MAN, isogenic disease model. The X-MAN here stands for gene X, mutant and normal. Um, so we what we use is, is to build sort of surrogate patients in a test tube. So the idea is, is that we can produce a cell line pair which enables you to t ask whether your drug is going to have some sort of uh, selectivity, for example, uh, cell lines in cancer bearing oncogenes. We're also able to try and mimic sort of disease progression by starting from the, the ground up with triplet repeat diseases and stuff like that. So. Um, our portfolio covers 500 oncology-related models off the shelves, which cover all the major cancer genes and variants. And we also have um, a, a custom service where we can produce um, cell lines to your specifications. So the, the whole gamut of the things Horizon does is very broad. So we're trying to be a CRO that um, enables our technology to be accessed by a whole range of clients. So there's not just the using the cell lines off the, off the shelf, which you can purchase in and get a license for, but we can build cell lines to your uh, specification. Where um, the projects uh, require a client to perhaps use a large number of cell lines, it might make more sense to contract us to do the work. So we have a what we call a Horizon Discovery Services business division, which is experienced in using these cell lines for client needs. And that's primarily what we're going to discuss today. One of the um, companies which is now part of Horizon was a cancer biology CRO called Hypoxium, founded perhaps five years ago as well. And this was built around a speciality in providing complex assay systems to especially virtual drug discovery companies. So all the experience of that organization is now folded into the Horizon Discovery Services part of Horizon. Um, we have all sorts of other things going on. We're trying to expand the use of our technology uh, by in an academic center of excellence program. So we're trying to enable academic labs to use the RAV technology for gene editing and then make the cell lines they, they uh, generate available to the wider community by putting them in our catalog. We're also trying to increase the efficiency of protein production in CHO cells by eliminating uh, certain gene products which get in the way of that. We have an interest in rolling out our technology in the regenerative medicine arena. Uh, we have formed a consortium for target ID with uh, H3 Biomedicine, which I will discuss in brief later on. And we've assembled a whole suite of drug discovery technologies and collaborators in what we term the discovery toolbox, which is available. So we're active um, in using our technology in translational medicine in a number of EU Framework 7 grants on colon cancer, on kidney cancer, and also on 4D cell fate and stuff. Um, and we're also hoping to use our reagents as standards in diagnostics. So there's a wide range of things which Horizon does. We have many customers and clients. As I said, we've been going five years. Um, and here's a sample of them in, in industry and academia. And um, to just to re-emphasize the position we have, we've formed this uh, group of techniques and um, various ways it can be accessed to provide a whole suite of drug discovery technologies. And the two we're going to describe today, uh, which is where arsenic cell lines can be available um, on a contract research basis, are in target validation mode of action analysis and in vitro proof of concept um, for assay development and compound profiling uh, in mid-stage drug discovery. So the capabilities of the Horizon Discovery Services Group uh, are quite broad. 
in the assay development and compound profiling arena. So you, we're experts in the use of these X-man cell line pairs. Um, we usually employ them as a pair or as a panel of isogenic cell lines. So this eliminates most of the um, variation that will be observed by using a panel of cell lines, for example, the ATCC. So we believe this creates more faithful models of human cancer. Um, and furthermore, where we are, say, knocking in an oncogene, we think this uh, recapitulates what happens in the tumor more closely than with overexpression of the cDNA. And there'll be some data to illustrate this shortly. Um, we are adept and we work with you to scout conditions to identify the correct cellular phenotype under which a particular um, facet of, of tumor biology will be revealed. And we optimize assay windows using known agents from literature before we work on your compound. Um, and we have the capabilities to screen compounds and cells and the low to medium throughput. And in certain assays, we can do some uh, quite high throughput screening because we've recently been enabled of, with some robotics technology. So we can do uh, lots of assays, and this is a list. We'll just go through some of them. So we can screen compounds and cell cellular assays. There's lots of formats we can do this in. 2D, 3D, we can adjust the oxygen concentration. We can do combinations with other compounds, and some examples are going to be discussed in a minute. We can also you know, uh, be contracted to develop bespoke assays, which um, high throughput screening groups could then employ later. Uh, we can do some target validation studies, and there'll be um, some more examples of that shortly. And we can look at transduction. We've got um, access to flow cytometer, plate readers, immunoblotting. And we are experts in using some of the complex assays involving matrix gel invasion, autophagy, and senescence. And many of these are available not for self kits, but we are adept at using these and have usually got some experience. Um, okay, and one of the items of emphasis is in this tumor microenvironment and specialist study arena. So, as anyone in drug discovery and cancer will know, the one, one major challenge faced by cancer researchers in drug discovery is predicting how your drug molecule is actually going to behave downstream in the complex tumor microenvironment. And assaying compounds for their effect on cells growing as 2D monolayers in complete media with Know, 10 times the level of, of physiological glucose is um, obviously fraught with potential false positives and negatives. And it's important to try and to bring the in vitro assay systems closer to cancer biology. And that's something that Hypoxium and Horizon Discovery Services specialize in, and especially employing the isogenic cell line offering within this. So we have a, a large number of assays which we set up and have used in anger. Some of this has been published in the peer-reviewed literature, and we're going to go through some of those examples now. But first, on the team, uh, currently we've got 10 lab-based full-time equivalent scientists uh, within the Horizon Discovery Services. They're experienced and highly skilled. Uh, the, their background is a mixture of academia and drug discovery. Uh, 10 members of the team have over 100 years of cell biology experience. Um, completed hundreds of projects for clients, and we're working with our clients in a number of ways, from uh, a fee-for-service basis on a testing compounds or small numbers of compounds, via FGE-funded assay development or uh, ongoing relationships with, especially with virtual drug discovery companies, and down to risk-sharing target validation collaborations. We've established a large sort of five-target alliance with H3 Biomedicine and the other Cambridge and working closely with them to, to validate some quite exciting type of targets from the literature. So this is a summary of the assays. Uh, I won't go through this slide, but it will be available um, in the webcast. But we uh, are enabled to do a large number of assays. It's a highly skilled team. And there's some things we're going to address in this presentation, including the reporter cell lines, um, soft agar, uh, some hypoxia and 3D assays, which are important to the points I wish to make about the use of the isogenic cell lines in cancer drug discovery. So on to slide 19, the importance of accurate disease models. So this is published data uh, from two laboratories, one in Boston, which is uh, all about the activated alleles of PI3 kinase. So 
if you introduce the cancer-associated PI3 kinase mutations in retroviruses, you get quite large effects in, in, in the mortal cell line MCF10A. So these cell lines, this introduction of this oncogene creates a major difference in growth rate, and it is transforming in the sense of enabling the cells to grow in soft agar and also as tumors in mice on its own. However, if you try and uh, recapitulate the physiological condition, and just introduce the, the same mutation within one of the two copies of the, um, of the PR3 kinase catalytic subunit, you get a different result. There's only a very mild induction of growth, and this is not transforming on its own. So this is quite a different response. So the point is here is that by using overexpression systems, you're not recapitulating the situation that exists in tumors. So vine knock-ins, um, we can sometimes drive sensitivity. So many people will say, um, a criticism we often hear about Horizon is we're starting with cancer cells, we're engineering cancer cells, and we're expecting to uh, create a, a situation where a cancer cell that we haven't got a model for can be modeled by adapting one that already existed. So we're making cancerous more cancerous. Is any of this going to make any difference? What's going to happen? So there's many cases where we can set up a situation where we can look at drug sensitization or resistance. And I'm going to go through some of those examples now. So uh, the, the RAV technology uh, works not just in cancer cell lines, but also um, other cell models. And in this case, tert immortalized uh, human memory epithelial cells have been um, targeted with various oncogenes, including PR3 kinase, P10, BRAF, KRAS, et cetera. So we did this in um, HME cells, as I said, and we tested uh, whether this sensitized them to the EGFR, small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitor, ERESA. So what we found was that when we introduced an EGFR mutation, um, and this is one of the small deletions found in cancer patients, we sensitized these cells to ERESA by a thousandfold, whereas um, introduction of KRAS or BRAF did not sensitize them. However, the, um, our system, our, our technology is able to model quite complicated disease systems, and so we've also characterized HME cells where the EGFR mutation has been combined with BRAF or PR3 kinase, and when this happens, we can get some resistance to the drug. So here, <coughs> excuse me, we're using um, cetuximab instead of ERESA. So the parental cell line is running along here. The, uh, the, the cells aren't by nature sensitive to cetuximab, but if we induce an EGFR mutation alone, they become um, sensitive and they, their proliferation in vitro is blocked. But if we introduce uh, a PI3 kinase or a BRAF mutation, on top of the EGFR mutation, the sensitivity to tuximab is overcome. So these, these results recapitulate what happens in, in cancer with the use of these antibodies. And so this is a, a good example where a technology can be used to um, create patients in a test tube. So moving on to KRAS more generally, um, so one of the companies, Cal Co-founders Alberto Bardelli has done extensive work on EGFR and relationship with KRAS and other markers of sensitivity. And this is all published work, which is being followed up with Horizon's involvement with some uh, European Union grants. So the situation, as you may know, is that um, anti-EGFR agents have restricted use in lung cancer and um, are only really effective where a patient has activated mutations um, in the EGFR gene. But unfortunately, 40% of patients are resistant to this, and this has been mapped back in classic work to those patients possessing a KRAS mutation. Um, so genetic testing of tumors has now been uh, in, brought into the clinic, and KRAS testing is saving nearly $800 million a year in misprescription by identifying the patients who won't respond to the therapy. But one key question 
is are all RAS mutants alike? So perhaps, given that uh, there's a most multiplicity of RAS mutations in cancer and ongoing signal transduction work would indicate they're not all equivalent, the, the question does beg itself as whether all these cancer-associated K-RAS mutations will confer resistance to tuximab. So this is something we've explored and we've had some very, very exciting results. So we've been using the colon cancer line SW48, which does bear an activated allele of EGFR. Um, such a cell line is normally sensitive to cetuximab, but if we knock in a codon 12 mutation of RAS, it becomes almost completely resistant. However, if we knock in the G13D mutation um, of RAS, this, uh, this resistance is not seen. So this would suggest that it's going to be possible that some of the patients currently excluded from therapy with cetuximab for lung cancer will actually be sensitive. So the, the next slide shows uh, two things. First of all, an in vitro experiment to show that we're able to recapitulate the situation we saw in xenografts in mice actually uh, in the tissue culture plate. So this is SW48 cells, and they are normally sensitive to tuximab. But if we introduce the a G12 uh, allele of RAS, they become almost completely resistant. But here, with the light blue line, we see if we knock in a G13D allele of RAS, we, uh, they remain sensitive. There is a small difference in, in the sensitivity, but uh, there's still a qualitative difference in response between the G12 and the G13 RAS mutations. So this begs the question of what happens to patients. So there's uh, quite a large amount of data from previous clinical trials available, and it's, this has been reassayed, reanalyzed by the clinicians. And what we found is, uh, while codon 12 RAS mutations, uh, patients with codon 12 RAS mutations gain no benefit, survival benefit from cetuximab. Those with G13 mutations do. And now, um, we're proud to say that a prospective clinical trial is now underway um, at various centers around the world, where we hope that our results are going to enable more lung cancer patients to be treated with cetuximab in future. Um, the next sort of uh, set of assays I wanted to discuss were around DNA repair and checkpoint inhibitors. So Horizon has taken the effort to become familiar and even expert at uh, awkward and difficult to, um, to implement assays such as a comment assay, gold standard assay for DNA damage, which it looks at DNA damage at the single cell level. Um, we're also able to use more high throughput assays as well, for example, looking at HIS2 and H2AX phosphorylation either by immunoblots or in ELISAs, um, in, each, in each case following DNA damage, and thus we can look at checkpoint inhibitors and also conventional cytotoxics to see how they work in cells. We have also, um, this is also a good point to introduce our colony formation assays. So we're able to do this with standard ATC cell, cell lines or the X-man cell line pairs discussed before. And with this sort of format where we plate cells at low density on, uh, in plates in 2D, we're able to look at long-term compound treatment. And this is ideal for revealing the effect of compounds that have a cytostatic mechanism and require many cell doublings to show their effects. So we tend to... Uh, perform assays so we can both count the colonies and by dissolving them uh, and staining the proteins with, with a colored dye, we can quantitate them uh, on the, on the bi basic biomass as well. So we can generate IC50s quite readily from this sort of assay. And the example here is a demonstration of synthetic lethality. So many of you will be aware of the situation. So in, um, in a typical cell, there might be two pathways responsible for withstanding a certain sort of insult, and the cell will withstand the interruption of either gene A or gene B. Neither effect will lead to a loss of viability. But in some cell, some situations, a cell might be defective in homologous recombination. For example, the classic, the classic case is that with the BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations, um, cells lose the ability to do homologous recombination, therefore they rec rely on non homologous end joining. So there's a, a key enzyme, PARP, which is required for this, and therefore by inhibit, inha, in, uh, inhibiting the action of PARP, 
we're able to selectively kill cells which lack the RCA2 function. So this is a classic thing which Pfizer, AstraZeneca, um, and Alan Asworth have exploited. And this is our own data. We've used the colon cancer cell line DLD1 where we've knocked in the BRCA2. Uh, we've knocked out BRCA2 in both alleles. And these cells are sensitized to an aparib, the PARP inhibitor, by some three orders of magnitude. Um, we're also familiar with characterizing agents such as CHAT1 inhibitors. So we're able to run classic cell potentiation assays with two drugs in combination. And this can be done in various formats. We can do proliferation assays as shown here, or colony form assay assays as shown before, or apoptosis assays as we'll see in a minute. So such systems are ideal for screening combinations of drugs which are only effective in combinations such, such as CHEC1 inhibitors. And we're also able to use such assays to explore our clients' ideas around novel combinations of existing drugs. We also have a flow cytometer, which is enabled with a, with a cell sorter. So for example, again, looking at the, the DNA damage situation, here we see the effects of um, treatment of the top isomerase inhibitor, SM38, on the cell cycle distribution. And um, this is overridden by when we have a CHET1 inhibitor in a classic Nicolazole trap assay. So we're also able to measure um, telomere length by fish and look at assays at various readouts. So we're keen to work with our clients to find the right assays for them. As I mentioned before, uh, we also have a variety of different ways for following apoptosis. We can look at caspase activation using kit-based methods with the caspase glow luminescence assay. We can also look at part cleavage um, using amino blotting. We can look at uh, tunnel assays for, for nick labeling. Or we can look at flow cytometry for sub-G1 peaks. Um, these can be multiplexed with cytotoxicity, so we can look at both viability and death in a single well. OK, to, to move on, um, something else where another sort of aspect of cancer biology we're familiar with is invasion as a sort of analog uh, for metastasis as well. So here we're familiar with a range of assays, uh, which include proliferation of endothelial cells, uh, classic invasion assays through extracellular matrices, and also two tubal formulation for, uh, formation assays using HUVEC cells. So here um, we've got an example of an MMP sort of inhibitor, which um, inhibits the proteases, the protease activity required to degrade the extracellular matrix for cancer cell HTTHs in this case to migrate through a Boyden chamber. But we're also able to use tube formation assays with HUVEX and scratch assays uh, to, to look at the ability of cells to migrate across the surface or form 3D capillary-like structures. So in essence, we're able to use fairly standard assays used extensively in drug discovery to look at the effects of tyrosine kinase inhibitors and uh, disruptors of the VGFR pathway, etc. So for follow-on projects, uh, we're able to quickly and efficiently work with our clients to characterize the effects of their compounds in these key assays. Okay. Um, back to the use of isogenics, there's a few examples here built around the PI3 kinase situation. So um, as I showed earlier, knocking in um, a PI3 kinase mutation in MCF10As, which is an immortal breast line, has quite a mild phenotype compared to cDNA overexpression. So um, there isn't a big growth uh, advantage impaired, uh, in, evoked by um, knocking of this oncogene. But if you look at the phenotype of the growth in a 3D matrix, in this case, matrigel, whereas the, the parental MCF10A cells form these sort of small 3D structures called a sini, the uh, PI3 kinase knocking mutation has a completely different phenotype. It forms these reticular tubular structures, which we think um, recapitulate an invasive phenotype in vitro. So we've um, published a work paper in PLOS uh, last year this, uh, discussing our work on this system. Um, but in short, we found that a PI3 kinase inhibitor 
uh, GDC 0941 had no greater effect on the um, NUPIN cells than on the parental control in standard proliferation assays. It induced uh, a G1 cell cycle arrest in both cases with um, GI50s in the half micromolar range. But what we did find at a lower dose, in the range of 30 nanomolar, we found that this compound is able to overcome this gain of function phenotype, the morphological change evoked by the PI3 kinase mutation, and revert it back to these ACNI structures. So this illustrates the value of um, the isogenic cell line system and the precision of um, the techniques that Horizon Discovery Services are familiar with. Um, PI3 kinase uh, mutations also has, has an effect on um, uh, mitochondrial function. So the, in HME cells this time, the knocking allele of mutant PI3 kinase uh, increases the amount of the anti apoptotic proteins BCLXL and BCL2 in the mitochondria. And um, we're able to isolate the mitochondria um, either post-treatment or pre-treatment to look at the effects of kinase inhibitors or other agents on their biology. Okay, this can include, you know, for, this has applications in toxicity profiling, biomarker localization as shown here, etc. Um, we've also used this PI3 kinase system to probe um, the sort of sensitivities that the possession of an activated PI3 kinase allele might impose to the cell lines bearing it to look at synthetic lethality, if you will. So this is, uh, again, published. We did this in collaboration with Celera. And the idea was to identify novel targets in mutant PI3 kinase cancers. So what we found in terms of gene expression was that knocking in the PI3 kinase um, cancer-associated mutations drove a very distinct glycolysis signature at the gene expression level. So in blue, we can see genes that were upregulated. This included hexokinase 2, um, two of the monocarboxylic acid transporters, um, in one of the enolase isoforms. Um, so this was sort of characteristic of the cells becoming more Wolbergian. Um, this was associated with, if you look at the black lines for the parental and the blue lines for the PI3 kinase knocking mutant, um, a relative reduction in the ability of the mutant cells to grow on non-glucose containing carbon sources. So this result and this result suggested that the cells may have become a lot more glucose dependent and that therefore targeting one of the glucose transporters might impair their ability to grow. And so we tested this with RNA interference. We knocked out hexokinase 2 in both parental cells and in the, the PI3 kinase knocking mutants. And what we found is that in the parental cells, depletion of hexokinase mode no, uh, did not impair growth at all, but we got a quite pronounced, although only quantitative, a growth inhibition by, by silencing hexokinase in the mutant cells. So the next thing I'd like to discuss is hypoxic assays. It's well established that hypoxia is very important in cancer biology. Um, this can affect both cell signaling and metabolism and key in cancer therapy nowadays, the resistance of cancers to chemotherapy, uh, which often works by oxidative damage, and radiation. So as I said earlier, uh, part of the Horizon Discovery Services team is built around the, an earlier company, Hypoxium, now part of Horizon, which as the name suggests, specialized in, in, uh, in hypoxia assays. So we have a Bactron anaerobic chamber, as you see here, so we're able to have complete control of oxygen concentrations within, and we're actually able to add compounds um, using the sort of glove box associated with this system. So we are well set up for um, looking at the differential effects of compounds under different levels of oxygen tension. Um, so we've evaluated over 30 cell lines for their ability to grow under different oxygen levels, both uh, parental cells and um, engineered ones, and we're able to profile compounds under tumor-relevant oxygen levels, as I said. Um, some sample data here shows that the bioreductive drug pyrapazamine um, is uh, sensitized by low oxygen environments, becoming um, several hundred times more potent. 
Okay. Um, this leads on to the 3D assays we're able to run. Um, as many of you will be aware, of course, that it's possible to grow uh, many cell types as a sort of spheroid if, if low attachment surfaces are used. So HCT 1 with cell cells, 1 with 6 cells, for example, form quite good spheroid, as do BT474s. And if one admixes fibroblasts in many cancer cells, are able to form these mini tumors um, in vitro, and we've been able, we're able to assay these using various sorts of assays. Um, we can look at viability, apoptosis, the rate of spheroid growth. And we're also able to cut the spheroids and do immunocytochemistry to see what's going in at the uh, at relevant levels and link this into drug penetration and the oxygen concentration within. For example, this this uh, data here where we've um, looked, we've stained both nuclei and um, the hypoxic marker pimenidazole indicates that while the outer regions of a spheroid are well oxygenated as you would expect, um, the, the cells and their respiration generate a steep oxygen gradient across the outer regions, which means the internal portions are hypoxic and therefore stained with pimenidazole. Um, these sort of 3D assays, uh, so apart from spheroids, we can also operate in um, classic anchorage independence assays using soft agar, where we have uh, characterized 40 cell lines for the ability to grow and establish routine culture conditions for more than 15 cell lines. And this technology is, has been key to uh, Horizon be able to efficiently drive a drug discovery program of its own in the last 18 months or so, which we're quite excited about. So I should emphasize Horizon doesn't wish to become a drug discovery uh, company, but occasionally a compelling opportunity suggests itself, and this is one where we've uh, formed a collaboration with Sentinel Oncology uh, to um, work on a kinase target, synthetically lethal with RAS. Um, the key thing here is that it's necessary to use a 3D system to evoke the dependence on this kinase target, which I'm not at liberty to reveal the identity of, sadly. So um, the data over here is looking at the growth of HCC ones of DLD DLD cells um, in comparing the growth of parental and one where the the, the activated RAS allele has been knocked out. So both cell lines grow very well in 2D. So the blue line is nearly reaches the same height as the red, but over in the 3D conditions, the um, the cell line where the cancer-associated RAS allele has been knocked out is impaired for its ability to grow in 3D. And much the same situation is seen in a dual allele knockout of this kinase target. So in HCT116 cells, uh, both, the wild, both the parentals and the double knockout cell grow very well, but in a 3D system, whereas the, the parental cells grow well, the um, the kinase knockout cells do not. So using this sort of assay system was key to us being able to us to determine uh, efficiently the effect of a uh, number of kinase inhibitors on cells. So we were able to efficiently support a multi-series H2E histolead chemistry program by Sentinel using a suite of assay reagents um, which we had. And we ended up with a situation where we had low nanomolar inhibitors which had submicromolar 3D specific effects on cells um, and a quite a tight linkage to the RAS phenotype. So this sort of um, program is now in late stage partnering discussions with the top 10 pharmaceutical company and we hope to uh, reveal partnership success and quite soon. But the thing I want to emphasize about this is the progression of this target rest upon Horizon's experience with specialized assay conditions. And there may be a large number of opportunities out there where specificities for particular tumor types have been missed by using standard growth conditions. And one thing we want to do is evangelize the community to use these more um, specialized assay systems, looking at hypoxia, anchorage independence, et cetera, to um, bring specific compounds to the fore and assist drug discovery. Um, there's a couple more tools which are potentially helpful with this process. 
So you'll all be aware of the use of luciferase assays to track promoter activation and do pathway analysis. So these sometimes done with stable knock-in, uh, sorry, with, with stable uh, transfection, sometimes transient. But in, in many cases, multiple copies of luciferase is required to be introduced into a cell line to get a big enough signal to track. And the other thing to remember is that any plasmid can only contain um, a, a relatively small portion of a gene's promoter, which may extend over several tens of kilobases. So if you really wanted to track um, gene expression it, at the endogenous level using a pathway report, so the logical thing is to knock the luciferase or another reporter into the locus you're trying to monitor. Uh, with conventional luciferase, this is problematic because essentially the protein product doesn't produce uh, sufficient intensity of light. But there is a new nano luciferase around which has been improved, improved and commercialized by our partners Promega called nano luciferase. This is a, a much smaller protein um, than its competitors, which perhaps aids confidence in that it's going to uh, have less effect on protein function. But the key thing is it's 150 to 1,000 times brighter. So um, we have collaborated Promega to launch a number of products where typically HCT116 cells have been engineered so that either the, the luciferase gene has been introduced in, uh, into an empty promoter or we fused it to the C or the N terminus as appropriate of the coding sequence of the gene we want to follow. And currently we have these systems available. Cell lines for licensing or available for access for, for partners uh, on a compound basis, compound by compound basis in a collaborative work which you can contract to do with Horizon Discovery Services. There's also the HALO tag. Uh, it's another technology which Promega have developed. This uses an E. coli protein which forms a covalent adducts with chlorine containing ligands. Um, and by simple amine chemistry, these can be derivatized in various ways. So it's possible to make a fluorescent halo tag ligand. There are cell permeable versions exist, so you can label cells from outside. You could also make um, affinity uh, chromatography reagents um, to capture proteins binding partners without overexpression. Or it will be possible to come in with reactive ligands. And so if a protein is forming a complex, we can uh, alkylate proteins around it with these reactive ligands. So for example, um, this is some data we have using a halo type KRAS. It indicates the loc this is SW48 cells. The protein takes up the same location as uh, the RAS we would stain with antibodies. And it's easily assayed using this help. The precision of RAS is easily detected using cell permeable halo tag ligands. So with this sort of system, you can envision some sort of pulse chase experiments where you, you label a population of cells and then look at the depletion of the protein with time. You can also do a whole range of translocation assays. You can look at rash recruitment to the membrane, uh, elimination from the membrane by adding various compounds, or you can look at classic translocation assays in and out of the cytoplasm, all using proteins which are tagged, which are expressed from the endogenous locus tagged with just a small um, GFP sized protein. So we've, we've used this system in anger, particularly around HIF1 alpha, where we get good expression. Um, this is uh, the HIF1 alpha signal. We get the nanoluciferase signal. It's readily detectable on our plate readers. We're able to uh, squash expression um, of the promoter reporter with an inhibitor of transcription. Um, and we've also got this embodied in a protein report where we've retained the HIF1 alpha protein sequence and refused nano luciferase to its C terminus. So under hypoxic conditions, we get an induction of, uh, of luciferase luminescence from this HIF1 alpha luciferase fusion protein, which we can eliminate with the drug YC1. So we've used this as proof of concept RNA screen. Uh, for targets that downregulate HIF1 alpha expression. So we used the protein reporter. Here's some data showing hypoxia induced it. Um, transfection and optimization, I'll go through the RNAi technology we're using shortly. But uh, by silencing HIF1 alpha, we're able to eliminate the luciferase signal without um, taking out the viability of the cells. Well, if we come along with a general antiproliferative sRNA targeted against PLK1, this causes pronounced viability loss as well as a loss 
of HIF1 alpha expression. So we screened 1,000 sRNAs using our robotic system here, and um, the data we're at liberty to talk about indicates that several uh, sRNAs targeting protein kinases in the RAF, MEK, MAT, ERK pathway, and also the PI3 kinase system, uh, reduced HIF1 alpha expression by considerably more than they affected viability. So CRAF was particularly um, effective, reducing um, HIF1 alpha expression by nearly tenfold with only a modest decline in viability. And as we get closer to the HIF1 alpha system, we, we found other kinases and transcription regulators, which also affected perhaps acting at transcription rather than HIF stability. For example, targeting CERT5 led to approximately doubling of the luciferase signal. Okay, so this takes us back to synthetic lethality. So as you'll all be aware, there's been many efforts, many high profile papers have come out in the last three years or so, um, where reporting the results of SARNA or, or SHRNA screens to identify synthetic lethal targets with, with RAS and P53, etc. Um, typically the field has been using nice non-isogenic cell panels so these have many background genetic differences, and typically a panel of seven, eight, ten cell lines might be required in order to correlate the synthetic lethal effects with the specific cancer genes which we're trying to find um, drug, druggable avatars of. Um, what Horizon's opinion is, is that using isogenic cell pairs, we can control for these differences in um, intercancer cell line genetics, and this will remove a key source of noise in synthetic lethal screens. So anyone who's used um, RNA interference technologies will know that they are prone to off-target effects, which can confound the phenotypes you observe. But we think by eliminating the source of noise by comparing small panels of, say, KRAS mutant KRAS wild-type cell lines with each other, it will be clearer to see the true hits. So we're actually working in a consortium called Synthetics with uh, H3 Biomedicine, and we're discussing uh, bringing a large pharma partner into that shortly. Um, so here we're trying to do a, a large sort of functional genomics exercise. Where we're going to hope to identify synthetic lethal targets for prominent undruggable oncogenes and tumor suppressors. However, we're trying to make the same sRNA screening platform available outside the consortium. So currently we've um, assembled not a whole druggable genome set, but just a small subset to concentrate the results on target classes that we believe are going to be modulatable with small molecules and have also of emerging significance in cancer biology. So it's just 2,200 genes in the library, which we think are high interest oncology targets. So any, any partner who wanted, any client who wanted to um, work with us would be free to use their own library. So the technology we're using is sRNAs using um, the Dharmacon SI genome smart pools. It's enabled in three, eight, four well plates. We use reverse transcription. We carefully characterize um, the reagents required to effectively knock down control genes um, in each cell line. We've got robotic liquid handling, plate reading to cut down human error. Um, but we're able to employ this assay both in standard and non-standard assays. For example, hypoxia or reduced serum. So um, the synthetics uh, consortium uh, has begun screening. The Horizon effort is going well. Um, the first genotype we explored was, was IDH1, and I can put up some data here. So we've got, this is a water flu pot, and the blue line shows the, um, the proliferation um, defect imposed by some siRNAs. These are arrayed in order of um, effectiveness. And over on the right-hand side, we've got the subset of siRNAs which are non-effective at our parental cells, which are HCD1 and 6 cells. But where we have knocked in one of the cancer-associated alleles of IDH1, we're getting some synthetic lethality. Um, we've also done the same screen under different conditions, under hypoxia, which causes general sensitization to many genes, and under low glucose. We get some consistent hits across all three conditions, and we get some specific ones as well. But this, this data proves that our technology is working well. We're able to put these assays together, do them in sort of three or four months at a reasonable price. And we think this could be a valuable offering to our potential clients. 
So um, to summarize, uh, what Horizon is built around is applying these XRAM models across different areas of drug discovery. Um, and Horizon Discovery Services aims to work with drug discovery companies around the world to assist them in their studies and, and make their, uh, their compound delivery to development candidates more efficient. So we've got a whole range of enablers. So we can use the XRAM panel to look at uh, oncogene-mediated sensitivity and resistance. We can confirm target uh, viability in the pathway using RNA interference. We do mode of action studies. We've got these endogenous pathway reporter system um, using Promegas, Nanolook, and Halo tag technology. We enable with fluorescence microscopes. And we have an in vivo partner in Crown Bio who have um, access to our panel of XMAN models and can do in vivo imaging. So in summary, why would you want to work with us? We are experts in using our systems. We've got these validated assay systems. We're experienced with the XMAN cell lines. Uh, we made them. We've characterized them. And we're good at using them. We are built around hypoxia's expertise in non-standard conditions. And this, I've given some illustrations of how important this can be um, to understanding uh, the, uh, the role of a target in cancer biology and also the effects of the drug on that target's function. Um, by contracting with Horizon Discovery Services, you're able to gain access to an entire XMAN panel on a per compound or a per project basis. Um, if you're considering purchasing uh, cell line pairs, we're able to evaluate their utility for you before you bring them in-house. And then um, we're also able to do assay development and provide validated assays to you for large-scale drug discovery programs. 